Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello all, welcome to this lecture. So, in the last lecture, we have been deriving lots of different equations on angular momentum. So, now you might wonder why are we deriving all these different equations, but we know spectroscopy is all about transitions between two different levels. So, we will see during this lecture that in the absence of this magnetic field or the externally applied magnetic field, the energy levels will be degenerate. But when there is an interaction or the torque that happens, that is j cross or mu j cross b, so that kind of lifts the degeneracy. So, the presence of this external magnetic field lifts the degeneracy. So, the energy levels will no longer be degenerate and some transition can take place or there will be some energy difference between these two levels. So, to understand this properly, we need to understand very importantly we need to understand angular momentum. So, that is the reason we have been talking about angular momentum that is the spin angular momentum as well as the properties of angular momentum in general. So, in the last lecture what we saw? We saw this j z that is the z component of the angular momentum is constant and also j squared is constant and the two other expressions we got was d j x d t equals gamma j y b and d j y d t equals minus gamma j x b. Now, from these two equations one for d j x d t and one for d j y d t, we can write let us say we say d square j x or d 2 j x d t 2. So, this we can write as d d t of d j x d t. So, this is gamma b times d j y d t and if we put the value of d j y d t what we get is minus gamma b whole square j x. So, if we write this final expression again, we can write d 2 j x d t 2 equals minus gamma b whole square j x. So, this as you can see is a differential equation and the solution to this or one of the solution to this differential equation is j x equals a cos omega t. So, here this a is a constant and this omega equals gamma b. So, similarly if we look into let us say d 2 j y d t 2 
from here we can get j y equals a sin omega t. So, this is because in the last lecture we saw that j x square plus j y square is constant. So, now we have j x equals a cos omega t and j y equals a sin omega t. And because cos square theta plus sin square theta equals 1, if we do j x square plus j y square, then it will be a constant that is a square. So, the main important thing is what does this equation imply? This implies that the vector j precesses along the surface of a cone. In other words, let us say this is my z axis and this is my angular momentum vector j. So, the j precesses along the surface of a cone and it precesses with an angular velocity. So, the angular velocity if we denote the angular velocity by omega, then omega equals gamma b and this precision that means, this j that is precessing along the surface of a cone, this precession is known as Larmor precession and because it is rotating there is a frequency associated to it and we know the frequency nu is related to omega by omega by 2 pi. So, we can write nu equals gamma b by 2 pi where nu is the Larmor frequency for electrons or any other spin half system or spin half particle there are two possible orientations of the s vector or the angular momentum vector the spin angular momentum vector. So, if we draw it this is my z direction and let us say this is my spin angular momentum vector. So, it can have two different orientations and the magnitude is given by h cross root over half times half plus 1. So, that is root 3 by 2 h cross, but the projection in other words the m s is plus half in one case and m s equals minus half in the other case. And this is because s equals half. So, for s equals half we have two spin states one is s equals half m s equals plus half. So, this is one spin state and the other is s equals half m s equals minus half. So, the first one is known as alpha or the up spin and the second one it is known as beta or the down spin. So, any observable in quantum mechanics has a corresponding operator. So, we are talking about quantum mechanics here because as I had mentioned in the last lecture spin has no classical analog. So, for electron spin the relevant operators are s squared and s z. So, this s square defines the total 
value of angular momentum and this S c determines the z component. So, this a square alpha is h cross squared then half times half plus 1 alpha. So, this is 3 by 4 alpha. So, similarly, uh, we have h cross squared here. So, similarly, a squared beta equals 3 by 4 h cross squared beta and for the S z case S z alpha equals plus half alpha and S z beta equals minus half beta. So, like spin or electrons other elementary particles. For example, if we think about protons or neutrons. So, these elementary particles also possess spin. For nuclear particles, the spin is denoted by I or I denotes nuclear spin. For both protons and neutron, they are characterized by I equals half. So, nucleus of let us say hydrogen atom is the simplest case, because hydrogen atom only has one proton. So, if I have a hydrogen atom which has only one proton, in that case the hydrogen nucleus will have I equals half, but other nuclei consist of both protons and neutrons. So, due to existence of spin both proton and neutron possess angular momentum or magnetic moment which are vector quantities. So, for a nucleus we have a resultant vector representing the angular momentum or magnetic moment. So, we can draw a table and so we can understand the value of i as a combination of the number of protons and number of neutrons. So, let us in one column we say number of protons and then we have number of neutrons. Then let us say we have spin quantum number which is denoted by i and finally, we will look into examples where we can find these scenarios. So, the first scenario is both the number of protons and neutrons are even. There are other scenarios, we can have number of protons even, number of neutrons odd or number of protons odd, number of neutrons even. And then there is a last scenario, where in both cases the number of protons and number of neutrons they are odd. So, we will divide this into three parts. So, we will see that when both are even i equals 0, when both are odd i can take integral values or we can say i equals 1, 2 etcetera. But in the case when either the number of proton is odd and the neutron is e even or the neutron is odd proton is even, the i can take half integral values. So, the values of i can be half 3 by 2 etcetera. 
And now, let us go to the examples. So, for i equals 0, the example is 12 carbon or 16 oxygen. And for the half integral values, we have examples in n 15, in this case i equals half. Similarly, for 13 c, i equals half, but let us say if we have 35 chlorine C L, then I equals 3 by 2. And for this odd odd case, where we have integral values of I, then the deuterium or let us say 14 nitrogen, in those cases I equals 1. So, the magnetic moment of a nucleus is denoted by mu n. And now, we should remember when we are talking about spin, we said the magnetic moment was denoted by mu s, where s stood for spin and now here n stands for nucleus. So, we can write mu n equals g n q by 2 m p h cross root over i times i plus 1. So, you can see we can find the analogy of what we talked about in the last lecture about spin that is about the electron spin and now we are talking about the nuclear spin. So, here this g n is known as the nuclear g factor. And this Q is the charge of proton, and MP is the mass of proton. And again, we can write this Q H cross divided by two MP this is known as the nuclear magneton. So, we saw for electron spin, we define something as Bohr magneton. In case of nucleus, we have nuclear magneton. So, it is denoted by beta, but we have beta sub n, n stands for nucleus or nuclear. As in the case of this electron, we can also define g n q by 2 m p as gamma n, where this is the gyromagnetic ratio. And like we saw in the last lecture, we can write g sub n beta n equals gamma sub n h cross. So, a magnetic dipole for a given orientation in a magnetic field which is given by let us say B and which is along the z direction has its potential energy which can we can write the potential energy as V equals minus mu dot B and because B is in the z direction or along the z axis, we can write this as minus mu z b z or again further we can write this as minus gamma b j z, where j represent an angular momentum vector. So, it can be either the spin angular momentum s or the nuclear angular momentum that is i. The Hamiltonian operator representing the interaction of an isolated spin will be h Hamiltonian will be minus gamma b j z. So, if 
psi is the spin eigen function. So, we know we can write h psi equals e psi. In other words, minus gamma b times j z psi equals e psi and j z is j cos theta because that is the z component of the angular momentum. So, we can write this as minus gamma b times m j h cross psi equals e psi. In other words, the energy E equals minus gamma b h cross m j. So, most importantly we can see when b is 0, then E is 0 or all the orientations of the spin vector has energy equal 0. In other words, when b is 0, then the energy levels are degenerate. But due to the application of an external magnetic field, different orientations have different energies. Thus, degeneracy has been lifted and different orientations belong to different energy levels. And these energy levels are known as Zeeman levels and the splitting of these energy levels is known as Zeeman splitting. So, now before we go into details of the spectroscopic techniques, let us now compare the spin and the associated magnetic properties in the two spin half particles. So, one is proton and the other is electron. So, we will make a table here to compare, we have electron here and we have proton here. So, the first thing we can compare is the spin quantum number. So, in this case we write s equals half and for proton we write i equals half. Now, if we compare the angular momentum so, here the modulus of s equals h cross root over s times s plus 1 and here the modulus of i equals h cross root over i times i plus 1. Now, we have also talked about something called magnetic moment. So, the magnetic moment that is mu s is given by gamma s and in proton we write this as mu n, n for the nucleus which is given by gamma n i and also the gamma what we have here is given for the electron as g s times e by 2 m e and here for the proton we can write gamma n equals g n q times 2 m p. Now, the value of g s and g n they are not the same. So, g s is 2.002, on the other hand g n is 5.585 and also this mu s 
can be written as gamma then h cross root over s times s plus 1 or we can write this as g s beta root over s times s plus 1. In case of proton, we can write mu n equals gamma n h cross root over i times i plus 1 or we can write g n beta n root over i times i plus 1. And for the Larmor precision or the frequency of Larmor precision, so let us put Larmor. So, for Larmor precision, we know that omega Larmor precision or the frequency that is new Larmor precision is given by gamma b by 2 pi or we can write as g s beta b by h. And for the proton or the nucleus, this new Larmor precision is given by gamma n b by 2 pi. So, this is g of n beta n b by h. So, we are talking about spin states. So, as we discussed there are two possible spin states. So, for the spin states there are two possible spin states one is alpha which is up spin and the other is beta which is down spin. Similarly, for proton we have alpha which is up spin and beta which is down spin and the only difference is in case of alpha m s equals plus half and in case of beta m s equals minus half. So, the energy now the here comes the important part for energy E of alpha is given by minus half g of s beta b and the for the energy of beta is given by half g s beta b. So, we can write the same thing for the proton E alpha equals minus half g s beta b and E of beta equals half g s beta b. But now comes the difference. So, in case of electrons the E of alpha is greater than E of beta and this is because for this case beta is negative. But for protons this E beta is greater than E alpha because in this case beta is positive. So, when we talk about some energy difference that is delta E given by modulus of E alpha minus E beta, this is G s beta b and this value is large, we will see the reason and it is important to note that this energy or if we divide by energy by h, we get the frequency this is exactly same as the Larmor frequency and we will also talk about it in another in the next slide. So, for proton delta E we can write this is E alpha minus E beta which is G n or this is G n beta n G n beta n beta n b, but this is 
small. So, in presence of an externally applied field, we can draw the schematics of the energy levels of the spin states of a spin half particle. So, let us say this is my energy axis. So, for electron what we saw we have beta which is lower energy. So, this is down spin alpha is higher energy which is up spin and so, this is half g s beta b, this is minus half g s beta b, but for proton as I said the energy difference is less. So, here the energy difference will be less and another thing that is different here we have alpha which has less energy and beta has higher energy. So, here the energy is minus half g n beta n b and here is plus half g n beta n b. So, a photon of frequency let us say the frequency of the photon is nu photon. So, this photon of frequency nu photon will induce a transition from the lower level to the upper one or we can say for the proton it will induce a transition from alpha to beta state and for electron it will induce a transition from beta to alpha state. So, and this transition will be induced when the energy of the photon becomes equal to the energy gap between these two levels. So, we can write this new photon which is given by delta E by H or modulus of E alpha minus E beta by H. So, this will be g s beta b by h for electron and g n beta n this is b b by h for proton. So, you can note that this new photon or the frequency of light equals the frequency of the Larmor precision which I mentioned when I was making the table. So, this photon frequency equals the frequency of Larmor precision of the spin system. So, since the frequencies match this is the resonance condition and that is why such a spectroscopy is known as resonance spectroscopy. So, for transition between nuclear Zeeman levels the spectroscopy is called nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR and for transition between electronic Zeeman levels the spectroscopy is called electron spin resonance or in other words ESR. So, NMR involving a proton is called proton NMR or proton magnetic resonance. So, we can write proton magnetic resonance or give or p m r and esr is also known as electron paramagnetic resonance or 
E P R. So, note that that the expression of frequency of absorbed radiation contains the beta. In other words, the Bohr magneton is for ESR and the nuclear magneton is for NMR. But since beta or the Bohr magneton is greater than greater than beta n or the nuclear magneton, this is because they are dependent on the mass of the proton and the mass of the electron. So, we can write that beta by beta n equals mass of proton by mass of electron because they are inversely proportional. And this is if you put the values we will get this mass of proton by mass of electron is 1840. So, in other words because beta or Bohr magneton is much much greater than nuclear magneton. The frequency and the frequency is directly proportional to beta. So, the frequency of NMR is much much less than the frequency of ESR. If we do the actual calculation, we can see that this new of NMR comes in the radio wave region and the nu of ESR falls in the microwave region. So, this is where we will end today's lecture and in the next lecture we will start with NMR.